Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, uh, music team, this morning. We have been blessed here today, and hopefully your heart is prepared as we worship together our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd ask you this morning, if you would take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'd like to read for us a couple of verses here from this passage of Scripture that we'll be focusing on this morning. And if you wouldn't mind standing in honor of God's word, I'd like to start there in verse 3. The Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Father, we thank you that you have given to us, Lord, the words of the scripture. And we are sobered by the reality of this passage, Lord, that tells us that we are in a spiritual battle. That there is more than meets our eyes. There is a spiritual battle that rages around us. Father, help us today to understand how to utilize the weapons that Paul describes. That the victory might be yours, Lord, we pray. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and beginning there in verse 1, we see that Paul, who begins by saying that he was meek, he's talking about this and he says, I urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not to be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. There is a spiritual battle that is going on in the church of Corinth, and we're kind of getting into the middle of it here this morning, if you don't mind. We've been minding our own business, haven't we? We've been trying to stay on the sideline, but all of a sudden we're thrust into the midst of this this discussion. It seems it turns out that the church of Corinth was opposed to the Apostle Paul. And I should be careful to note that not everyone there was feeling that way. But among these false teachers who had embedded themselves in the church of Corinth, there was a very derogative attitude that was being submitted about the Apostle Paul. They would say things about the Apostle Paul questioning his apostleship. They accused him of being a big man when he was far away, but not so big when he would show up face to face. It's true, the Apostle Paul was probably not big in stature. He was probably not uh, dominant uh, in such a way. But we would understand that the Apostle had a meek spirit and was humble internally, something that they were tremendously missing. Paul is going to make the statement that you're accusing me, he basically says, of not being spiritual. You're accusing me of being basically a carnal man. And he says that this is the accusation, and we have the accusation leveled here in the first couple of verses, but then Paul changes the matter around. And he begins to give the explanation of the reality behind these accusations. You see, in truth, when we look at this, we recognize, as Paul would say, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. Our battle is not according to the flesh. And Paul changes this topic of a personal attack upon him to the overarching problem, which was a spiritual problem. There is a battle that is raging in the hearts of men. And because the spiritual battle is so very real, Paul looks at the physical words that are being spoken about him and acknowledges that this really is not the root of the matter. This is not the essence of the problem. The essence of the problem is there is a spiritual battle that is going on for the hearts of the people in Corinth. 
Paul recognizes this and he realizes that there is much at stake. There are many who will battle according to the flesh. And Paul makes that notation there in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh. What does it mean to walk in the flesh? Well, simply he's saying we live in according to the flesh, don't we? Did you get up this morning, drink some coffee, you know, eat a piece of toast or cereal or something? Uh, you did that because you were hungry and we live according to the flesh. That's, that's, that's us. And it's easy to look and see things uh, as they are. And there are things that battle. There are forces that battle. There's forces this afternoon, football games, right? They're going to battle according to their flesh, aren't they? Tom Brady's got to throw the ball left-handed because he's hurt, but I have confidence in him all day long. (laughs) It turns out my wife's Eagles are in the second game and the Patriots are in the first game. Now, that's just a, a, a war against the flesh that's going to be waged this afternoon. Now, if the Patriots win and the Eagles win and they're both in the Super Bowl, oy, 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 um, that's much more of a spiritual battle then. <laughs> you can pray for our household if that happens. You and I know what it's like to walk in the flesh. We do it every day. You're doing it now. We live life in the flesh and we understand the quotients of time and matter and so forth. But in reality, there is a spiritual battle that is warring. And this is what Paul wants to bring to our attention. Notice that he, is, he says, we walk in the flesh, we're not warring according to it. He goes on in verse 4 to say, and you'll note this in your passage, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. There are other places in Scripture where Paul references this spiritual battle as well. One of them is over there in Ephesians chapter 6 when it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. You may remember verse uh, uh, 12 there, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers and against powers and against the, the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is the reality of the spiritual warfare that is going on. And so Paul goes on there in verse 4 here of our text when he says these weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful, and there's a purpose for these weapons. These are unique weapons. These are supernatural weapons, and the weapons are going up against some pretty amazing things. In fact, these weapons uh, are going up against fortresses. These are strongholds. These are places that have been built so as to withstand attack. And then he goes on and he says, these are speculations. There are speculations. These are arguments. And in some versions, they're going to translate that Greek word, arguments. And the last is lofty things or high-mindedness. High-mindedness is is equal to those things which are thought through to the nth degree. And Satan is very, very good at building up these fortresses. He's very, very handy at being able to to bring this about. These arguments, uh, we get the word in the English from the the term in the Greek, which we would understand logic, and it has uh, a part of that as as part of it, uh, so that we understand that this is a thought-out process, these arguments. Well, obviously, when we're talking about these fortresses and we're talking about these strongholds, we're talking about these arguments and the high-mindedness, one of the things that we're not really talking about here are those structures that have been built for wartime purposes. And there are many of these structures. You can go around the world. You can go here in Maryland, and you'll see structures, forts that have been built up. There are many of them. We understand what they look like from a physical standpoint, and they can be intimidating. They're made out of stone. They look pretty tough. I mean, imagine trying to scale that cliff to get up there to that, to that big building there. Some of them are downright scary. I mean, don't you see the, the monkeys flying out of the top of that thing? <laughs> All these things are physical, aren't they? But understand really what is at stake. Because really what is at stake here is that which is spiritual. When Paul writes and he talks about the fortresses and the speculations and the the lofty things, he's talking about barriers that Satan has placed in front of the minds of people in the world. And these barriers have been in place since the very, very beginning. 
so that in the early church, in the time of the early church, Satan has put up arguments that have thwarted the gospel. And this is ongoing and has even gotten more difficult as time has gone on. The world today does not run to Christ to place their faith in Jesus and find deliverance over sin and the consequence of sin because there are barriers. The God of this world has blinded their minds. See what we're talking about? So the very essence of this struggle is for the hearts and souls of mankind. We live in a day today where it's very, very complicated. There is a lot that's complicated. I came across a, a book, it's a few years old now, called Cultural Captives by Stephen Cable. It's the beliefs and behavior of American young adults. It's a, it's a fascinating read. He goes through and he builds it all off of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. In Colossians 2 and verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. He builds this entire argument based upon Colossians 2.8. It's a good verse for you to go back and take a look at. You see, the battle, as he would say, uh, has really divided young adults in the church today into four categories, three mainly. And he breaks this out in such a way that's fairly fascinating. I'm going to look at some statistics this morning so that we understand the fortresses that we find ourselves as a church up against in the world today. He goes into this study and he breaks out these four categories. He breaks them out, number one are the free ones and number three are the captives, according to Colossians 2.8. All of them, these four categories, are actual references to evangelicals. That is, people who would claim to be born again from evangelical churches. I'm not talking about going to the marketplace, standing outside the movie theater on Sunday afternoon and just talking to random people. These were studies from four major groups, and he's combined all of their findings into this book. He says that for born-again individuals, our survey found they fall into three nearly equally sized categories. The first one are free ones. They have a biblical worldview, and they attend church regularly, and that accounts for about a quarter, 26%, of all of those who are surveyed. Number two are the partially captive. Remember Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. And I think King James says vain deceits. I just remember memorizing that as a kid. But you know, as you look at the partially captive, they don't have a biblical worldview. But they do attend church regularly. And out of this group, 33% or one-third find themselves in that category. That means that one-third of all the evangelical young adults don't believe or take or hold a biblical worldview. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Then thirdly, there's the captive ones. They don't have a biblical worldview, although they would say that they are saved. They do not attend church regularly, and that's about an equal third, one third. Then there's the partially free. That's just a minor group. They have a biblical worldview, but they don't go to church. Keep that in mind if you would. Those between 30 and 40 years old we're almost 30% more likely to subscribe to a biblical worldview than those between 18 and 24. His data shows that over one-third of all 18 to 24-year-olds are no longer affiliated with any Christian religion today compared to about one in five 30-somethings. And so you begin to start to see some trends. I want to talk just for a moment about this whole question of a biblical worldview. We are familiar with that statement. He holds to, they hold to, she holds to a biblical worldview. But what is exactly meant by that? What does it mean to hold to a, a belief that there, you have a biblical worldview? How many think that I have a biblical worldview? That's good. 
Does it mean that I believe the Bible is the word of God? Does that mean that I have a biblical worldview? Do I have a biblical worldview because I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God? You see, I find that many people don't really understand what is meant by a biblical worldview. Take, for instance, your social issues of the day. And there are, in this, uh, in this book, what he did was he took three categories. And I like how he lists them out there. He talks about television and movies. You know, television and movies force or put forth a uh, attitude towards the world. They have their own worldview. Are you surprised to know that it's not biblical? Okay. Social issues that are really being affected. He goes through and he makes this huge list, but he talks about things like abortion, a woman's right to choose. Only extremists oppose it in the television and movies mindset. It's, it's fine. The popular opinion today, many support the woman's right to choose. The biblical teaching, the sophloria, it's always wrong. Sex before marriage, can you imagine? In television and movies, it's encouraged and expected, only nerds don't do it. Popular opinion, it's expected if not encouraged. You'll never guess the biblical, always wrong. Adultery, in TV and movies, it depends on the situation and it's a normal state for most people. Popular opinion today, it depends on the situation. It's a common activity. You'll never guess the Bible's position on adultery. It's always wrong. On and on for divorce and gay sex and gay marriage, pornography in television and movies. Hardcore is not generally acceptable, but soft is great. Popular opinion, soft is fine, and hardcore is tolerated and readily available. Biblical teaching, always wrong. He goes on, materialism, lying and cheating and so forth, and he begins to to pull it apart. Then they start to ask the questions of those who would be in those four categories. Remember the categories? Number one is free, all, you know, the free people. They're free because they're not taken captive by philosophy and empty deceptions. These are the people who believe in a worldview that is biblical, who attend church regularly, and only 26%. 66% uh, is divided, but 66% do not take a biblical worldview. Here's what it looks like. Less than one-third of born-agains or evangelicals had a set of beliefs consistent with the biblical worldwide view taught by Jesus. Now, this 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 is basic theology. This is what Jesus is teaching. This isn't what a church sucked out of its thumb or rules and regulations that they just happen to come up with. We are talking about the absolute bedrock teaching of Jesus Christ. Less than 8% had a biblical worldview and a set of cultural beliefs taught by Jesus in the New Testament. He goes on and he says, as the culture has adopted unbiblical views regarding pluralism, that is more than one way to get to heaven, sexuality, honesty, etc., the majority of evangelical church members have adapted to accept the new cultural positions rather than to stand firm in the truth taught by Jesus Christ and his apostles. Well, that is troubling, isn't it? You see, for us, if you're going to be a person who says, yes, I hold to a biblical worldview, what you're saying is you hold to the teachings of Jesus Christ, the teachings of the New Testament, the teachings of God's word. And if you'll hold to the teachings of God's word, it means you always agree with what the Bible says on issues of abortion and sex before marriage and pornography and divorce and on and on it goes. You are taking that biblical position. That is what it means to hold to a biblical worldview. Now, young adults in the church, that 66% of them that are not taking this biblical worldview are saying that they are Christians, but they are nominal Christians. They are Christians in name only because they do not take the biblical worldview on some of these issues. Many Christian young people today find that it's fine to have sex outside of marriage, it's fine to to believe in divorce, it's fine to do this, it's fine to do that, and so because of that, they would not be labeled or put in the category as people who are holding to a biblical worldview. 
They may go to church with us. They may walk in the same places we walk. But there are differences within the body of Christ, perhaps. I'm going to challenge that here because on another page, uh, he asked two basic questions among evangelicals. And these are very, very basic questions going back to what we would understand as pluralism. Two questions. Think in your own mind how you would answer this. Muhammad, Buddha, and Jesus are all valid ways to God. Muhammad, Buddha, and Jesus are all valid ways to God. They ask this question of the young people. I'm asking this question of you. Second question is, Jesus Christ is the only path to God. 80% of those who take a biblical worldview and go to church regularly... 80% got it right in saying that, no, number one is wrong. Muhammad and Buddha are not ways to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. They also got number two correct in saying that Jesus is the only true valid way to God. 20% of the free ones got it wrong. But it's worse. 40% of the partial captives agreed with this. That means 60% said, no, I don't believe that. If you don't believe that, my friends, you can't have eternal life. If you believe in that there are multiple ways to get to heaven, you can't be a Christian in the pure sense of the word. You can't truly be born again. You can't truly have been regenerated with that belief. If you believe that Jesus is only one way to get to heaven, you are mistaken and you're going against the scriptural teaching. You may be in the mainstream of philosophy today, but you are going against the grain of scripture. 20% of the third category, the captive ones, agreed with that statement, those two questions. On the whole, over half of born-again young Americans believe that Jesus is not the only path to God, but that Muhammad and others are equally valid. Does that get your attention? Last but not least, in doing this study, they came to the conclusion that by the year 2030, 12 years from now, remember this book was written several years ago, in 12 years, over half of the, Americans, the America's total population would be willing to put down on a census, I have no religious affiliation whatsoever. They have no biblical world view. You see, we live in a time where these fortresses are very, very real. These fortresses are formidable As we look at that picture in front of us, we recognize that, boy, that'd be a hard place to try to take. But Paul is going to go on. Let me bring your attention back around here now to 2 Corinthians 10. Paul is going to go on, and Paul is going to say, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful. And they are able to destroy speculations and high-mindedness or lofty thinking. They're able to, to pull down those things that are raised up against the knowledge of God. We're able, Paul says, to take captive every thought. You and I find ourselves in a spiritual battle, and it's nothing new. It's really nothing new. These castles can be formidable. Here's a castle here that's Pretty scary, isn't it? It is a sandcastle. <laughs> and here's the amazing thing, because this is what the gospel does. The gospel is all-powerful, and it's changing hearts and lives still today. Do you believe that? The very gospel that Paul is speaking about, the weapons of the warfare here in 2 Corinthians, are still our weapons of warfare. And the result is that when the truth of the gospel comes up against the lofty thoughts of men, the speculations and the fortresses, the strongholds, the result is that they will come tumbling down. And even the seagulls will see it. 
You see, when you and I encounter the gospel, the gospel is powerful. And the power of the gospel is just as real today as it was when Jesus died on the cross. You see, we see the changes in the hearts of mankind. And this is what Paul is saying. We need to see these changes. These changes need to be real. You and I, as we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to hearts that have barriers that are in place, we can watch those barriers tumble down because of the great power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do not have to be trained to to, to be able to argue these points. In fact, we don't even want to go in and argue these points. Allow the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to come in and pull these things down. Paul says, I see it. It's a spiritual attack. The one thing it can't stand up against, one thing it'll never gain victory over, is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, know this, that the spiritual warfare continues on today, and it is very, very real. Carson said this, Paul's language of destruction here is not merely about winning arguments or debates. He means something far more. His weapons destroy the way people think and demolishes their sinful thought patterns. The mental structures by which they live their lives in rebellion against God. That's the power of the gospel, isn't it? Where would you and I be if the gospel of Jesus Christ did not come in and change our lives? Where would we be? What would our thinking be like? How would we be living our lives? Take your Bibles, would you, and go with me to a neat verse of Scripture back in Proverbs. All the way back there in Proverbs. It's amazing as you read through Proverbs. If you read a chapter a day... This would be your chapter, right? Chapter 21. Go to chapter 21 and verse 22. The writer of Proverbs says, A wise man scales the city of the mighty. So it's not just James Bond who does this, right? That would be that which is physical. But spiritually, a wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. What a great verse. You see, there are those strongholds and people today are trusting in those strongholds. But a person who is wise will take the gospel of Jesus Christ and introduce the truth to a world that desperately needs to hear the answer that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the only way to God. You and I, I challenge all of us today to be that wise man who scales the city. Be that wise person who brings down that stronghold in which these people trust. Allow the power of the gospel, not your power, but allow the power of the gospel to work in the hearts and lives of mankind around us. Show forth love for those who are around us by sharing the gospel so that these strongholds come down and Jesus Christ is embraced. It's comforting to know, isn't it? That the Bible is still the answer. That salvation is still the answer. No matter how many of these barriers Satan throws up, the gospel will always come along and pull them down. As man has succumbed more and more to Satan's craftiness, it may become a little bit more challenging, but it's never impossible to pull these strongholds down. God's word is superior We just need to get the word out. We need to be that vehicle who shares our faith. Probably the single most scary thing is that if the church becomes a dormant church in the sense that we stop sharing our faith with others, where will the hope come from? 
Where will the answers be? Where will the change generate from? You and I have challenges before us, but know the awesome power of the gospel and what it is able to accomplish. Paul looked at the difficulty around him and he said, you know what, this is a spiritual battle. But as long as we have the truth, the truth will pull those strongholds down. Let's pray. Take a moment with me, if you would, please, and just bow your heart before the Lord, would you? And as you bow your heart before the Lord this morning, allow yourself to spend a moment just looking in your own heart. What is your worldview? How would you answer those questions about Jesus Christ and other world religious leaders? Are they equally valid? Can you get to heaven in multitudes of ways? Will people who are sincere in their religions go to heaven even though they don't have faith in Jesus Christ? If you hold to a biblical worldview, you hold to the reality that Jesus is the only answer. He's our only object of faith and he is our only hope. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure about where your eternal destination lies. The unfortunate reality is that for people who are trusting other than Jesus Christ, they really don't know. They hope, they long to to be right, but there's no peace. If that's where you find yourself this morning, I urge you today to seek peace with God. The only way that can really happen is if that peace is anchored in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been resisting placing your faith in Christ, but maybe today's the day you'd say, Pastor Kevin, I would like to place my faith in Christ and know that there is peace with God. I'm going to have a word of prayer. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, God's at work in my heart. Pastor Kevin, please pray for me. Be willing to do that. If you just slip up your hand right now, I'll pray for you today. You say, I'm I'm not sure about where I'm going to spend my eternity, but I want to be sure. Amen. God's at work in my heart. I want to have this answer. I want to have the peace that only God produces. If you're here this morning and you would say in honesty in your heart that maybe the worldview that you have is not according to Scripture, I encourage you today to align your thinking with the Word of God. But I also encourage you today to do an honest appraisal of where your heart is. Because the main reason, it seems, from all of these these polls that have been taking place and all these surveys is that many of the people who do not hold to a biblical worldview really do not hold to Christ alone and a faith in Christ alone. Look deeply into our hearts today. Remember that the spiritual battle is not always obvious. Sometimes it's going on behind the scenes, we just don't see it. Spiritual battle always has the souls of men as its objective. This is important stuff, in other words. Your eternity depends upon it. Let's be mindful of these things. Father in heaven, we thank you, and we just so much appreciate the love that you have shown to us. But we find ourselves today rejoicing in the power of the gospel, how it was amazing to be able to penetrate our hearts. Those of us today who are here who know you as Savior, Father, we are amazed by your grace. We're amazed by the love that you have shown to us and by the power, the transforming power of the gospel. Help us, Father, to share the good news of Christ with others. Help us, Lord, to be proactive in taking this message out from among these four walls and bringing it into our communities. And Lord, how I pray that you would work in hearts today. Challenge those, Father, today who are thinking about where their relationship with Jesus Christ uh, really finds itself. 
work in their hearts, I pray, that they might know that they have eternal life. We give you praise for all these things now in Christ's precious name. Amen. Before you leave, just a couple of announcements. First of all, the care and concern folks are here at the front. If you have questions about faith in Christ, if you've got questions, spiritual questions, you want to talk with someone, ask some questions, maybe you want to pray with someone, they're here for you after the service. Uh, coming up this week, don't forget the pancake breakfast on Saturday. That's to um, uh, gain some uh, traction financially for the winter weekend for the teens. That comes up next month here in February, so just keep that in mind. Also want to mention that coming up uh, the in three weeks, three weeks from today, it's February the 11th, we have uh, some changes that we've been talking about. If you're hearing it for the first time, that's great. We're just trying to announce the daylights out of it and try to pull many people into it as we can. Service time change for the second service. It backs up 15 minutes. And uh, our theme is, you'll see there, to worship together and also to learn together and then to serve together. Uh, a couple of opportunities that we have for you to be involved in serving. One is that we have an immediate opportunity. I, I picked that up from one of those little ads on a bulletin board. There's an immediate opportunity. For, you know, we're, we're looking for help. Um, so we have an immediate opportunity uh, for you to be part of a hospitality team uh, that will get refreshments ready and so forth um, between our services and around the, the Learn Together time. So that's an important aspect that we're trying to fill. If you would like to be part of a team, Please see Chris Floyd about that. Second of all, Kids Zone, that's our children's church that'll take place from 1010 to 1050. We're looking to amass a few teams that will be trained with a, a fresh curriculum and also uh, uh, some, some uh, teaching and training uh, so that you can get involved. If you're not involved in kids' ministries now or you, and you'd like a, a fresh opportunity, we invite you to get involved with this. See Amy McDougall if you have some questions about that or you just want to just blindly walk in and say, use me however you want to use me which is that, that's the way we prefer, right? So, so but, but if not, if you got like 40 questions, that's all right, you can ask. Um, seriously, these are great opportunities to serve the Lord here. So there'll be more of these as time goes on, but I just wanted to roll that out to you. More on Learn Together soon. A couple weeks we'll be announcing um, some more detail with regard to that, all right? And uh, we'll be all ready to go February the 11th. So pretty exciting, all right? Let's have a word of prayer, and then you're dismissed. God, we just thank you for our time together. It's a blessing, Lord, to be in the house of the Lord today. It is such a blessing to be able to, to share in, in singing, Lord, uh, wonderful songs and hear uh, music that's uh, exciting to our soul. And we pray, Father, that you would just bless us now as we've uh, had the opportunity to be exposed to the word of God. May we, may we think on these things throughout this week and beyond. Lord, uh, work in our hearts and help us, Father, to be light and uh, salt in the world in which we find ourselves living today. We give you praise for all of these things. May you bless each one and give us just an awesome week in Jesus' name. Amen.